everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm pleased to welcome you all to the first uh, installment of our new Humanities Seminar Series. Uh, tonight's event is, uh, the title for tonight's event is Regeneration and Resurgence, Current Research in Indigenous History and Languages. My name is Pamela Sweat. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Humanities here at McMaster. Along with my duties as Dean, I'm also an historian specializing in the cultural and social history of Germany in the 20th century. In the Faculty of Humanities, we explore human culture in many different ways. Our faculty, staff, and students can be found in art studios, in experimental laboratories, in archives and libraries around the world, and around conference tables and in classrooms on campus. We have 115 full-time professors in disciplines as varied as music cognition, philosophy, communications management, and many more. Here, we believe that the humanities has a critical role to play in helping to solve the great challenges of our age. Our people and our graduates make a difference every day because they seek not only to understand the world, but to change it for the better. And this is why we believe uh, in events like this one and why we wanted to, to put this together. We believe in lifelong learning as critical to good citizenship and to personal well-being. And that's why we're thrilled to share with our alumni community some of our most interesting and groundbreaking research. Tonight, uh, I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. Uh, Alan Downey is an associate professor in the Department of History in the Department of Indigenous Studies at McMaster where his research and teaching focus on the history, uh, where his research and teaching focus on the history of indigenous nationhood, sovereignty, and self-determination. Ivona Kucharova is an associate professor in our Department of Linguistics and Languages, and she is also the director of the Center for Advanced Research in Experimental and Applied Linguistics, uh, also known as Ariel. I will invite each of our panelists to provide uh, further information about their experience. Um, Alan, why don't you get us started tonight? Well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to everyone that uh, decided to join us tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, so my name is Alan Downey, as mentioned. I'm Deketh Nakazlu Wetten and the Losulu clan. Um, my nation is the Deketh nation from central British Columbia. It means the people that travel upon the water. Nikazli Wawetan is my first nation, um, which is uh, the era, area of where the arrows of the dwarves flowed through. Uh, Lesulu clan means frog clan. And uh, my nation's from central British Columbia, but I was born and raised in Waterloo, Ontario. And tonight what I'm going to be doing is kind of weaving a web of stories for you about my research and about what I focus on. And that is uh, generally what I like to call resurgent histories. And I'll detail that a little more as we go on. Um, but early on in my life, um, I've had a, a lot of experiences that have affected uh, and impacted the, the ways in which I research. And one of those things that had a tremendous impact on my life as both a researcher and as a historian, uh, as well as a kind of athlete, was playing the game of lacrosse. So uh, in 2018, I published my first book on the history of lacrosse in Indigenous communities. And that stemmed from uh, when I was a youth. I started playing lacrosse when I was 10 years old. And one of the key aspects of that was in lacrosse circles, lacrosse is known as an Indigenous game. And as an Indigenous urban youth growing up with kind of struggling with my identity and in search of what it meant to be an urban Indigenous youth, I gravitated towards that. Um, so growing up, I kind of fell in love with lacrosse and history, and I was able to kind of merge those two passions through playing of the sport. Uh, then I went down on a lacrosse scholarship when I was about 18 years old, uh, played at Mercyhurst University, I ended up coming back to grad school at Wilfrid Laurier University and focusing on researching about the history of the game of lacrosse in Indigenous communities and the kind of cultural significance and importance that it has in Indigenous lives. Uh, since that time, since 2018, uh, I've actually transitioned my work now towards ironworkers. 
So looking at the history of indigenous peoples that build things like skyscrapers and bridges, and the way in which I approach all of these things is through the lens of self-determination, nationhood, and sovereignty. That is to look at the ways in which indigenous peoples uh, asserted their nationhood and asserted their self-determination, either through the sport of lacrosse or through ironworking. So I'll, I'll be de detailing that a little bit more tonight, but I think I'll turn it over to Ivana for the her introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to second uh, Alan, thank you for coming out tonight to this virtual space. Uh, my name is Ivona Kucherva. I specialize in comparative syntax, which is an area of cognitive science of language that aims to uncover the structure building system common to diverse languages of the world. Specifically, my work focuses on how these universal structure building systems contribute to semantic interpretations. I'm originally from the Czech Republic. I'm a speaker of a native speaker of Czech, which is a language that was got almost extinct about 200 years ago and came back to its current um, life uh, only through a very diligent uh, reclamation efforts of many people. And I came to McMaster through MIT and University College London. That is, I have, I think I went through like five different passports by the time I was 18. My research has always been influenced by my local research environment and the local language communities. My current work on indigenous language reclamation, which is going to be in the center of tonight's discussion, is indeed the result of such environmental impact. Uh, the, when I uh, moved to Hamilton, the, I found myself in a proximity of several indigenous communities, and I have had uh, the uh, very lack of meeting some um, absolutely brilliant indigenous colleagues who were kind enough to introduce me to their languages and to their culture and who have become the main inspiration for uh, starting even thinking about doing this type of work. Uh, I currently lead two major research projects on language reclamation. The first one is a partnership project before indigenous community-based adult immersion programs. One is Ongwena Gunjokwa of the Six Nations. The other one is the Twatati language program of the Oneidas of the Thames. And then uh, we work with two US-based programs. Both they both are uh, in the New York State. One is a Tuscarora language program, and the other one is a Seneca language program. Now, the goal of this project is to create a decentralized network of programs in order to share their experiences, best practices, and resources among the communities and help individual communities to improve their language reclamation efforts or to help start a language immersion program in their own language. The other project is in its very beginning, and that's a project on documentation and revitalization of lullabies and infant and child-oriented speech in Ghana. What's important to mention here is that the uh, the projects came to life uh, not because they were originally my idea, but the, they came out from discussions with my uh, indigenous colleagues and friends, and the and they are a response of uh, the needs that were expressed by the communities, and were in this very um, organic process of figuring out how we can work uh, coming from a university with indigenous communities in ways that are recognizing their sovereignty and their knowledge and cultural norms. Thank you both. As we enter to the, the discussion section of our seminar, I invite our in attendees who have a question for Alan or Ivona, uh, or both of them, to uh, please enter it in the Q&A anytime um, during the rest of, of the hour. I think there's a specific button um, at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Uh, and then we'll save some time at the end to, to try to get to some of those questions. So let me start by uh, asking a question to both of you. Um, what inspired you to pursue these areas of research and what considerations do you take into account as you work with indigenous communities uh, and indigenous histories? Uh, maybe we'll flip the order this time, if that's okay. Ivona, do you mind jumping back in? No, it's all good. Um, right. So um, the as you, I think you've been already able to see that from um, the introduction, right? Uh, Alan and I are coming from very different, very different uh, perspective and very different direction. While he is uh, building on his lived experiences, the I'm coming um, to indigenous research as an outsider, and the um, the so. My current work on indigenous language reclamation is a result of two happy accidental encounters. The first one was when I met my uh, colleague uh, Alan Jans from University of Toronto. 
So Alana has uh, spent a number of years working with Inuit speakers in the Natsiavut, and she um, has uh, involved me on one of her grants and brought me to the community and started teaching me some, you know, very essential basics, like how you uh, work around um, uh, people who might be coming from a different place than you come from and how to figure out like what's the best way of doing uh, research in this type of environment but really what has been um uh, truly formative was when i met uh uh, Obena Dega, Brian Markle, uh, one of the founders of Ongo and Angonjokwa, a Ghanaian adult immersion program in the Six Nations of the Grand River, and his younger colleague, Ryan Decker, who is a professor of linguistics and indigenous studies at the University of Toronto. Uh, the, I was actually introduced to Ryan by Alana Johns. Um, the, so when I, when, I, when I met him, and especially when I uh, met Obena Dega, I was, and I still am, tremendously impressed with the uh, quality of the language program they have built and the depth and sophistication of linguistic insights that went into teaching the language and creating teaching methodologies. And so when they invited me to start working with them, it was a very special opportunity to learn from them about their language and culture. And I have been extremely fortunate to have their guidance when navigating how I, as a non-Indigenous researcher, might be able to positively contribute to the language reclamation efforts of their school and their community. And the I also feel, um, and kind of more and more in getting uh, more immersed in this type of work, that the extraordinary language reclamation efforts of the sort we see in the Six Nations community and their success have not been sufficiently recognized. And so there's also work to be done in uh, recognizing like the really tremendous uh, work people in these communities have done. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, when, when we work with language reclamation, like the need for language reclamation, I think extends far beyond indigenous communities themselves, even though that clearly like is in the center of these efforts, because indigenous languages of Canada don't have a significant writing tradition and indigenous knowledge is mostly transmitted through the language. Now, when we lose these languages, not only we're losing a core part of indigenous knowledge and culture, but we're losing knowledge of Canadian history. And as a result, we remain restricted to very narrow view from the settlers colonial lands that leaves out many peoples and their experiences. Now, I already mentioned when it gets to considerations to this type of work, really the major and primary imperative is that the work needs to be driven by the communities and their needs. So, you know, I, as a um, comparative uh, syntactician, as a linguist, like, you know, I have I have my pet projects and things I would love to learn more about, but yeah, I always have to very carefully with whether I'm going to embark on these projects when they may be just taking resources away from the communities or instead like try to work uh, in tandem or like working on projects that are really brought up by my colleagues and uh, and people who I hope I can now call my friends. Alan. Um, so for me, I've kind of mentioned this a little bit, but um, my early interest in focusing on Indigenous histories of lacrosse came from my own experience of playing lacrosse. Um, not only my only experience of playing lacrosse, but also being an Indigenous youth. So growing up, um, part of that process of discovering, or not discovering, but cementing my identity as an Indigenous person and being uh, Deketh, um, was gravitating towards this idea that I was playing an Indigenous game. We would hear stories of in, uh, Indigenous lacrosse players and teams, um, terrific athletes growing up in lacrosse. And I kind of wanted to know more about this. And as I got interested in history uh, throughout my high school years, and especially in my undergrad, um, I, I kind of started to question why we didn't know specifically about this game where we knew it was an Indigenous game, but the story is not kind of well told of the development of that game or the historical historical circumstances of this game, how things evolved or changed or were reshaped and reformulated. And so when I started at, at Wilfrid Laurier University for my master's and really started plugging into this. It really was a, a process, a personal journey, in addition to a, a scholarly journey that I went on, um, where I was being exposed and 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 uh, connecting with Indigenous elders and knowledge holders and um, experts, these people that were mentoring me, not only in stories of lacrosse, 
but in stories of their governance, their culture, their ceremonies, all things that are tied to the game and to the sport. See, in indigenous circles, lacrosse is not compartmentalized. Sport is not compartmentalized like it is in Western society. So all aspects of your life in indigenous lives and all that brilliance um, coexist and intermingle with the sport itself. So the stories, the creation stories, let's say, for instance, of the game of lacrosse tie back to the creation stories of Indigenous governances or Indigenous uh, knowings um, and learnings and how Indigenous peoples come to know and, and get their expertise. Um, and so part of that is through these stories, these creation stories of where the game of lacrosse came from. Um, and so what's incredible is I really discovered I, I had this passion for history and of lacrosse, and I was able to kind of merge those two things and to pursue those things. Um, then from there, what ended up happening was because I was somewhat of a proficient lacrosse player, I guess, I'm not sure what, how to describe myself, um, but uh, because I had this background in actually playing the game uh, and I had a background in grad school of being able to research and tell stories of this game, I then merged those two things and started working with Indigenous youth. Um, so what I would end up doing is going to community, working within communities like Six Nations and Ganawage, just outside of Montreal and Akwesasne, and all across the country, taking these incredible academic, very theory, uh, theory forward discussions and kind of making them accessible to Indigenous youth and telling them these histories that they may not have heard of or they may have been lost to time or it might have skipped a generation or they might know them very well. Um, but really sharing those histories with them through not only hosting lacrosse camps, but kind of lacrosse lecture series, um, which is something that I continue to do to this very day. From there, what ended up happening was I was hearing so many stories of these incredible Indigenous lacrosse players that traveled to um, L.A. and Vancouver and Toronto and played at Maple Leaf Gardens in the 1930s and the 1940s. I was hearing all these incredible stories about their proficiency in lacrosse. But one of the things that was coming up a lot was their livelihoods, um, because lacrosse was something that you did after work. Well, during their work hours, many of these Indigenous lacrosse players were iron workers. And so that kind of launched my new project, which is looking at a history of Indigenous iron workers, as I heard stories of these lacrosse players who worked all day building skyscrapers and bridges um, and doing those types of things. So it's been an incredible journey just to be able to kind of hear these stories. And I will say that I'm really lucky because I'm in the position where the Indigenous people that I work with, the Haudenosaunee elders, knowledge holders, um, these experts, they're sharing their knowledge with me and I just have the time and space to be able to share those stories with academic audiences. It's not really my brilliance coming through, it's their brilliance, it's their words that have been sh uh, sharing through the history of lacrosse or ironworkers, and it's their experiences um, that have been just an incredible journey to be able to share with people. So I, I really appreciated that experience. It's been life-changing for me over the, the last decade now. Thank you both. Uh, I'm going to come right back to you, Alan, with the next question. So you've used the, the, the concept of resurgence now several times in what you, what you shared so far. Can you talk about what that concept means to you specifically and how Indigenous research in particular, historical research in your case, um, how it can contribute to resurgence? Yeah, so in um, Indigenous studies uh, and elsewhere among Indigenous knowledge holders, there is this theory and the set of ideas known as resurgence. 
basically it stems from the 1970s with a guy by the name of John Mohawk. Um, then there were a few uh, political scientists that worked on this work in, in the early 2000s. And really the biggest proponent of it has been a scholar by the name of Leanne Simpson. Just an incredible, uh, brilliant mind. And the argument or the theory of resurgence can be broken down into this. Basically, what's being argued is that it's really important that Indigenous peoples confront uh, the colonial outside. But it's equally important, and this is where resurgence fits in, that Indigenous people focus on the Indigenous inside, that we focus on the rebuilding of, and the reignition, let's say, of our fires of governance, of language preservation, uh, of our culture, of our ceremonies, of our laws, and all of these things. It's really important that we do, that we focus inward as Indigenous peoples, as in my instance, the Keth, uh, the, for the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Mi'kmaq, uh, it's important that they focus inward and work on Mi'kmaq laws and work on their Mi'kmaq governments and reignite the fires of those things. And I make the argument that I believe that research can have an important role to play in all of this, that Indigenous peoples can use research partnered with communities and community experts and knowledge holders um, and community organizations and researchers to help reignite and rebuild these fires of Indigenous governance, of Indigenous languages, of uh, Indigenous laws, and of Indigenous histories. And I think that they can be a really important piece of that resurgence movement that focuses on the Indigenous inside. And one of the really powerful things about this, and the thing I love most about this, is it centers Indigenous peoples on their own terms. It's not asking permission, as Leanne Simpson would say, of the kind of colonial outside or governments or government funding. Um, those things aren't needed for resurgence. What's needed is our knowledge, our brilliance, our activism, our work as Indigenous peoples within our communities to, to rebuild these things. Um, and to kind of articulate those things. So I think research has a really important role to play in this um, and can contribute a great deal, uh, whether it's looking at how Indigenous lacrosse players might have crossed the international boundary line, the imposed international boundary line, and fought for their sovereignty and self-determination. Uh, it could be how ironworkers did the same or created a hub, a network, in New York City among uh, indigenous iron workers and helped uh, Mohawk and Oneida and Cayuga iron workers kind of um, flourish in this mega city and in this incredible place that they're believed to not exist in, right? Um, it comes to being that indigenous peoples are really written out of the history of an urban environments. Uh, intellectually and physically, they were removed from these environments, even though they had urban indigenous histories long before contact. Um, the perception is that indigenous peoples don't exist within urban cities and urban history. And we know that's not true. And so I think telling these stories is just as important for non-Indigenous peoples or those outside of Indigenous communities, but I think it's equally as important for those stories to be told within, uh, within Indigenous communities, and it could help support these ideas of resurgence and of the revitalization of Indigenous communities. That's terrific. Thank you very much, Alan. Yvonne, your research centers on working with adult immersion programs. Why is it important to teach language to adults? Well, because adults are, are consciously involved in the process of resurgence. The, uh, the, I really like the way um, uh, Alan explained the, um, how insurgence plays out and uh, how research uh, can play a role in it. And the, you know, one of the things that um, I found uh, like really inspiring on the work I've been doing is the uh, working with, with programs that um, have come about out of their own uh, agency, like using their knowledge and their experience. 
right? And the and especially um in the uh, partnership project that we have with the four Haudenosaunee uh, adult immersion programs, the uh, idea is that to really multiply the knowledge and the experiences that are within the individual communities and to use that knowledge to help other communities while making them more or less independent of the uh, outside colonial, colonial structure. And the so adult immersion programs are um, part, like, in my mind, a really critical part of uh, language reclamation efforts. The uh, It's part that has not been really recognized and there's a very little research being done about it. The, um, the Haudenosaunee languages are essentially all of them are in a state of uh, severe endangerment. So some communities don't have any native speakers left. Some communities have only very few speakers left. The uh, what that means is that, and that's a, like a direct result of um, um, of residential uh, schools and the imposed um, and intentional um, restrictions on on uh, language use and and um, repression against indigenous communities in Canada and elsewhere. Um, the and the situation has become even worse now over the last few years because of COVID. The uh, we have lost like really high number of native speakers and the and it's a like that's a really uh, deep and traumatic loss for people in the community because the you know as a university based scientist I can be looking at the numbers but these people are looking at their you know aunts and uncles and close friends and people who are part part of their family so we are in a situation where we don't really have uh, that many uh, um, uh, native speakers around. And although it might seem intuitive that language should be taught to children because children learn much easier than adults, we know from linguistics research that children won't proficiently acquire language unless their community speaks the language. Now, the in most, as I already said, in most indigenous communities, the natural intergenerational language transmission got interrupted. What that means is that children no longer learn the language from their parents, grandparents, aunties, other people in their immediate social circle. Now, anyone who has tried to raise children in Canada, now uh, in a language other than English or French, this if this was my class and I was owning the Zoom, there would be a little poll and I would now ask like who here is like first, second generation and whether they share the experience, right? But the if you have that experience, you know that the uh, that it's really hard for the children to actually speak the language fluently. Now, because what children, what children really do, they're they're functional and they're going to figure out what is the you know, primary language of their social environment, and that is the language that they're naturally learn. Now, the uh, when we are teaching adults, the uh, the situation is quite different because when adults learn their language, they can then teach their language to their children and other children, and they can support uh, other communities' language needs. Right? The so we're now. I'm specifically talking about communities that uh, either have only very few native speakers left or even no speakers left. For example, there are no uh, living Ghanaian speakers in the Six Nations community. The uh, the graduates from these adult immersion programs, they can become teachers at all levels of language education. They can perform transition tasks for their community. They support language needs for ceremonies and so on. So this is these graduates that are the drive and the main resource for language resurgence within communities. And ultimately, the communities need much more than adult immersion schools. And that's something that we're currently uh, also looking at, like trying to figure out how we can combine the efforts we've been uh, putting in building uh, adult immersion programs and in a network around them with other uh, language reclamation efforts within uh, the communities. But without the schools, language reclamation becomes much harder, perhaps even impossible. Right. And the and I really want to stress like that the uh like the enormous success of these of these of these programs. We are now in a situation you might have seen it um in the news, I think like in a poll when the new census numbers came out, when uh, it turned out that a number of indigenous speakers within the country actually started rising. And the reason is that the there's a rising number of uh, second language speakers, that is uh, typically young adults who have decided to reclaim their language and to contribute to the reclamation of the languages. That's terrific. I, I, I had forgotten about that. I saw that um, census uh, stat and yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, Ellen, so you've um, given us a, a few hints about resurgent histories and uh, you mentioned both your Iron Workers Project and the Low Cross Project. 
can you can you maybe um, build on on some of those sort of hints you've given us about resurgent histories and and some examples of uh, of um, the impact that uh, that work can do for either indigenous communities or or also uh, non indigenous. Yeah. So. Within indigenous studies, we now you now know that there's this concept of resurgence. And one of the arguments that I make, along with many other in incredible historians, uh, Brittany Luby, Sarah Nichol, um, many of these kind of uh, young and upcoming indigenous historians are doing some incredible work around this idea of resurgent histories. And ultimately, what resurgent histories is, is it takes the, the research done uh, within historical methodologies and takes the concept of resurgence and says, there's a possibility here, there's an opportunity here for history to play a, a role in resurgence. And what that would look like, or what I think it looks like, is first and foremost that Indigenous history shouldn't and isn't centered around colonialism. One of the things that's happened um, in the past and in the historiography, the writing of history and indigenous history, is generally it's been, uh, if indigenous peoples are included at all, uh, it's been the topics have always been centered around colonialism. And yet what I argue, and, and Brittany Luby and Sarah Nichol and all these incredible historians that are doing amazing work are arguing is that no, indigenous history exists beyond, above, in between the spaces and cracks of colonialism. In fact, there's an intellectual sovereignty that should be taking place, that can take place. Uh, that's a kind of a, a term that Robert Warrior coined. And I kind of ascri ascribe to this, this idea of an intellectual sovereignty, that Indigenous peoples don't have to center themselves around colonialism and don't have to center their histories around colonialism. So what I mean by this is one of the really neat projects that I got to be a part of was telling the early history of the first and only Indigenous sports team that represents itself as a sovereign nation. And that's a lacrosse team known, used to be known as the Iroquois Nationals. Now they're known as the Haudenosaunee Nationals. Well, in the early 1980s, they started up a team, the Haudenosaunee did, that is. Uh, they decided that they were going to start up a lacrosse team to represent the Haudenosaunee Nation in international competition as a sovereign nation. They had never relinquished their sovereignty. In fact, what Audra Simpson would say is their sovereignty was nested. It's nested within the sovereignties of Canada and the United States. It's not always visible to people, but they've never relinquished it, and it still exists, and it's still there, and it's still articulated. It's a nested sovereignty. And so one of the ways that they wanted to articulate that they still had and maintained their sovereignty and self-determination as an Indigenous peoples was through form, formulating a lacrosse team. So I was lucky enough to be able to work with some of the founders, the co-founders of that team and write their early history from 1983 to 1990 on how that team was form, or formulated. Okay, that's all great, um, but how is that a resurgent history? Well, it focuses on the indigenous action of self-determination on their own terms, their intellectual sovereignty, let's say. But one of the really neat things, and I'm not taking credit for this at all, it's, it's something that was mentioned to me because the work was done by the individuals that led this initiative. But something, one of the best, greatest compliments, let's say, I got from that work and from the book um, was in fact an Anishinaabe team. So the neighbors of the Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee are in Northern New York State, Southern Ontario, uh, Southern Quebec. The Anishinaabe are to the North and West of the Haudenosaunee. Well, one of the arguments I made in the book was that the Haudenosaunee who successfully established this international lacrosse team to represent themselves as a sovereign nation, they shouldn't be the only nation that's able to do this. In fact, the Anishinaabe and the Mi'kmaq and other teams, Cree teams, uh, all have a legitimate argument for why they should be a sovereign team in lacrosse. They helped create the game and they are sovereign, uh, they are sovereign in their own right. And 
what ended up happening was uh, somebody I actually played lacrosse against read the book and decided that they were going to take this up, that take this challenge that I kind of put out into the book that other nations should be doing this. Again, it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do. It just, I was sharing great stories. It was this individual who started a program um, called Anishinaabe Badagawiwin um, that took up this idea from this example of the Iroquois Nationals to actually form their own international lacrosse organization for the Anishinaabe Nation. And so you see them trying to um, articulate their sovereignty through this device, lacrosse being the device. And I was just lucky to be able to talk about that device and that vehicle of Indigenous self-determination. It, it was a really incredible message to receive, um, just saying, hey, I read that in your book, and it really inspired us to to do this. Not that I, and I didn't do anything, but um, it was a pretty incredible experience and probably the best compliment I've ever received. Yeah, um, no, I can imagine it extremely gratifying. Uh, Ivona, I know that you've recently, um, I've heard little bits, uh, read a few uh, sort of uh, communications messages around this, um, heard about some of your grants connected to it. Um, and that is that you've are, have a sort of new line of research um, connected to babies and lullabies in particular, uh, and infant-directed speech. Um, it's, a, it's a big switch from, from adult learners, but um, could you tell us a little bit about that new project? Well, I know everyone wants to work with babies, right? Because they're very cute. Um, so this project is a is very different from uh, the other stuff I've been doing in uh, not only that um, it's not with adults, but um, it relates to language uh, targeting infants and um, children, but also uh, because the I'm entering a very different uh, territory in the Indigenous research because the the work with the um, with the adult immersion programs is I could work with with um, organizations that already are you know they have some kind of internal structure. Um, the, the even though it's based like in ma and methods of, of um, indigenous governance, the you know it's kind of clear who wants to talk to and so on. They you know they have already declared their own sovereignty. They have a total control over what they do, how they do, and so on. Now the uh, the idea of working um, of trying to uh, collect some uh, data on um, um, Haudenosaunee specifically Gamyeha lullabies and uh, uh, infant and uh, child oriented speech came from um, discussions with with uh, various women around me and uh, also with with men around me, especially older men who still remember um, lullabies like from their parents that who might have been uh, in residential schools, but they still might have used lullabies when they were when they were growing up. Um, the and uh, we all have this like a very close emotional relationship to the first language of our childhood and the first language experiences. The, uh, the language oriented uh, towards children is critical when we're trying to have a successful language reclamation because the, uh, the, it's great that you know we have these adults coming out from adult immersion programs, but if they, when they're trying to raise their children, if they cannot talk to their children, around the things that we talk to children about, of course, then what happens is that they immediately switch to, switch to English. And the, um, the original purpose of the, of the whole enterprise is, 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 partially, is partially lost. Now, the problem is that even though uh, many indigenous communities have done tremendous work in collecting various stories and information about their languages, the, uh, this type of, of um, uh, language collection is uh, usually um, oriented towards language of adults and very often it's the language of men. And so we actually have very little knowledge about um, about lullabies, about language of that is uh, uh, targeting, targeting infants and children. We also have very little knowledge or all knowledge has been lost about language uh, that's specific to women. So the uh, I've been talking like to my, um, uh, 
to my colleagues from let's say the task or program like the women there they don't know how to say words like you know menopause or menstruation because that has never been part of what has been uh, recorded and so there are whole parts of everyday language that uh, are either getting lost or might get uh, permanently lost so the so the idea behind this project is to try to collect whatever is out there and the uh, when we originally started thinking about this the idea was like try to see whether we can somehow you know plant it back or help with with reclamation of um lullabies and um these corners of um of language functionality in a back to communities the uh the work is quite challenging we're really only at beginnings because the uh, one thing is that we're kind of trying to cross different community boundaries which means uh figuring out like how we're going to deal with who is owning the uh the data that we collect there needs to be some kind of agreement among the different communities right the uh that's one thing the other thing is the moment you're trying to approach uh, any work with children of course uh, indigenous communities have like a very long history of traumatic experiences of how people have been treated and especially children how children have been treated and so there's a lot of there is a lot of distrust and so uh we need to figure out how to do this in a way that uh, would be meaningful to the different communities and that would be in accordance with the different rules and expectations of people from different parts of different of of the of, of, of different different communities but the uh, I'm really hoping that um uh that we can make at least some progress because we know that um uh like early uh language exposure is critical for healthy language development we also know that uh, lullabies and infant-oriented uh, speech is uh, critical for healthy um, infant-parent bonding. And so if we can bring indigeneity uh, to these parts of like a first uh, life language interactions, I think that would be tremendous for um, both for reclamation of, the, of indigenous languages, but also for reclamation of indigenous um, uh, identities, sovereignty, and everything that's tied to that. Plus, as you said, it's fun to work with babies. Although I suppose they're probably a bit challenging too, in some ways, huh? Don't probably always uh, do exactly what they're what what the researchers want them to do at any given moment. Oh, we're like a million years away from from uh, working with actual actual babies. Actual babies. Like, like, the, like the first step really is to try to find adults that might remember these lullabies right, right. we've been really fortunate and because the we, we were like we didn't even know like how to start doing this and then um uh Gornio, who is a, a, a research coordinator in um on our partnership grant so she mentioned kind of in passing that the um when her baby was small that she hired uh this woman who specializes in um uh raising children in Angara but also who has been collecting lullabies for her own archive. Mm. And, the, and I manage, um, her name is Hale Brandt, and I managed to hire her for this for this project. So the so she's like an incredible starting point because she has right. done uh, lots of lots of work um, uh, in a couple of communities and she already has like her own data collection and having her as someone who has worked with with um uh with babies and who has an extensive experience with uh teaching children um Ghananiha, like that really makes things much easier but it's still like the the first the first step is just try to collect as much as much of the right. different language pieces as we can across different communities and then uh to figure out like whether there is any meaningful way to kind of like plan information so we've been we've been thinking about like working so the, there are uh several like really excellent uh birthing centers in surrounding indigenous communities like there are um nurses that have been specializing in figuring out how to bring uh indigenous knowledge back to uh birth giving practices and everything having uh to do with with child raising and early age so we're hoping that we can maybe use uh some of the existing existing places and like work with them but the, it's really going to depend on like what the communities in the end will want to do and whether uh, we will find uh, anybody who will be interested to work right. directly with us if not it's just just the fact that the language would be documented somewhere and whoever would like to have an access to it would be able to access it 
from the communities like that to me would be like a sufficient success of the of the grant but of yep. course yeah if we could break with the babies that right right <laughs> yeah um so alan can you maybe catch us up on where you are right now and in, in what you're working on Yes, yeah, so I, I've turned my focus 100% to, um, well, not 100%, but uh, majority of my focus to Indigenous iron workers. And one of the experiences I had um, that, that I had an opportunity to actually create a digital animation based on the history of Indigenous iron workers. And so what this was, was um, I worked with a former student of mine at McGill University. And, and, and an undergrad student uh, who had a family background in Indigenous ironworking named Carly Loft. And together, we decided that we wanted to kind of tell the story in a new way. How do we tell the history of Indigenous and especially Ginyagahaga ironworkers, Mohawk ironworkers from Ganawage? How do we tell this history in a unique way that will get engaged public audiences and even possibly Indigenous youth? So one of the ways we thought about doing that was to take the history that I was researching and collecting all these materials about for an academic book um, and turn it into a five minute short digital animation. Well, this has kind of led me to my next project. So I'm working on a manuscript on a, on a, a second book uh, on the history of Indigenous iron workers. Um, particularly in New York City, but elsewhere as well in Chicago, Detroit, Buffalo, all play really uh, important roles in urban Indigenous history. But from that experience of creating that digital animation, I decided to create a kind of new pro project that I'm actually talking about for the first time publicly tonight. Um, I haven't really shared it uh, with many people, and it's just in its kind of um, very early stages, but it's called the Resurgent Youth Indigenous History Lab. And what it is, is it brings together Indigenous youth, community-based organizations, and professional historians to create these resurgent Indigenous histories through the creation of digital animations. So it's a youth-led initiative where the participants, the youth, the Indigenous youth, select, write, and design a digital animation based on local Indigenous histories that focus on the Indigenous inside. Uh, as an act of resurgence. So I'm launching the first one as we speak, um, at least the research process of that project, um, working with local Indigenous youth and local organizations um, to kind of commemorate these incredible Indigenous histories that Indigenous youth are inspired by and select themselves. Um, so that that's going to take up uh, my focus for the next few years, I think. Um, I'm hoping to do three of these in three different communities. So the first one, I'm focusing on Six Nations of the Grand River um, and local communities there. Uh, then I am shifting to Ganawage, just outside of Montreal, where I have a long relationship. Um, I've, I've worked in both Six Nations and Ganawage for over a decade now and working and partnering with the community organizations there and local high schools. Um, and so I'll be going to Ganawage for the second digital animation. And then the third one I'm hoping to actually do in my own community of Nakazu Owetan um, in a few years time. So I'm really looking forward to this project. Um, again, like I say, it's in its early stages, but uh, it's, it's, it's going really well so far and it's been a lot of fun. Sounds terrific. Uh, I want to just encourage everybody we've got we're starting to get close to running out of time here. Um, I've got one more question that I want to ask Ivona, but let me just uh, and then we're going to go to um, the questions that have come in from the Q&A. So if you still have a, a question in mind, please uh, post it there uh, and we'll see how many we can get through. Um, so before we jump to that, then Ivona, one more question that I wanted to ask you. Um, and, and what role, you know, you've, you've been now working um, on issues of, uh, of, you know, supporting Indigenous uh, resurgence yourself over the last few years. Um, and what, so what role do you think a university or maybe other forms of educational institutions um, can play in the process of resurgence? Yeah, so this is a very intricate question, right? Because Indigenous communities have had 
lots of broad relationships and negative experiences with uh, Western researchers. And so we really need to focus on relationship building and on figuring out how to do meaningful work that will be driven by the community's needs and questions. Uh, the one thing which is critical here is to really like recognize the um, the extreme um, uh, sophistication of indigenous knowledge and to recognize it in its own right. And I think part, part of the discussion uh, has changed quite a bit from the um, uh, from moving from um, a reconciliation framework to resurgence because now the uh the we still have, still have to find a way there uh, the you know I, I think that an ideal ideal outcome would be a, a setup where the uh that within uh research projects we're learning one from another but the but I think we have to do it in a way that is going to provide space for um indigenous communities and um uh to figure out their their own questions and uh, build off their own um, resources. There are things we can help with, but it really should be more in forms of offering and rec recognition. The uh, We can help with training, we can help with providing additional resources to the work being done. Like the, I always joke that I have absolutely no intention to do this type of work until I retire. And I have definitely no intention like to be leading these grants. It's kind of absurd that an indigenous researchers researcher is leading like these large projects. But the uh it's sort of uh, you know it's a function of the fact that we do not have that many indigenous scholars with uh PhDs of like the relevant um uh seniority who would be able to actually be leads on these grants, but I think we're getting there. And so I'm hoping like, that we're going to see more and more. Um, uh, indigenous uh, folks coming out with from uh, graduate graduate schools and embarking on their research. I do the I mean to see how it's going to play out because the the people I work with, the uh, they want to work with their communities and I think that's great and they should be embedded in their in their communities and I think that is also going to shape how the relationship between universities and communities is going going to play out and I'm I'm kind of hoping that we're going to see more of uh, knowledge creation centers, more of, of almost like an academic source, but they will not be tied to the traditional uh, university structures, but are going to be uh, embedded within the communities themselves. And like the Six Nations Polytech is a nice right, example right. of yep. that, how it might look like. Yep. Great. Okay. So now I do have some questions that I want to get to that came in from our audience members. Um, and the first one is also for you, Avona, and that is, if, could you tell us uh, the project you're sort of imagining? Now, I know you, you're not working with the little ones yet, but the, the lullabies project, if, if you could kind of jump ahead in time, um, would you imagine that might be something that could actually become a long, longitudinal study in the long run, where you could sort of trace those babies and, you know, track them as they get older and maybe then look at their children? So the answer is uh, yes, no, and we don't know, right? <laughs> so the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, one of the reasons like we're interested in this because we want to see whether we're going to see effects on healthy language development and whether we might see changes and um, um, like a parent infant bonding, whether they're like, you know, like the uh, reclamation of indigenous language from really the first language experiences might have a positive experience on, on indigeneity and might contribute to better mental health and so on. The, uh, at the same time, so that would be, it would be very helpful to have a, to have a longitudinal study at the same time, all depends on whether that's what the uh, communities we work with would like for themselves, right? So the if it turns out that there are um, parents and their children that over time would be interested in being part of something like that, that would be tremendous. And if, can, if we can do it in a way that it would not be uh, intrusive in any way and would be respectful of the of the individuals and and of their on their communities then yes, if it turns out that that's really not uh, doing any good to anyone, then uh, the, then we should not, we should just stay like with the, with creating the revitalization resources and leaving it up to the communities to do whatever uh, they see fit to do with them. Excellent, great, thank you. Uh, Alan, one for you, um, not as a historian, it's going back to your athlete days. Um, could you, do you have a sort of favorite memory from all of those years of, of playing lacrosse? 
Uh, I do. I have, I have a couple, but um, after, actually, after I stopped playing competitively, um, I was drafted professionally and I played collegiately and uh, I stopped when I was about 27, uh, when I was 27 years old. And I started working with Indigenous youth in youth corrections facilities. Um, and the idea there was an organization would introduce the game of lacrosse and then kind of cultural teachings from the game of lacrosse grounded in local stories and local knowledge. Um, and part of my kind of dissertation was looking at uh, examining that or, or sharing those stories with the brilliance of Indigenous elders and knowledge holders. Um, and so it doesn't really go back to my lacrosse playing days. Uh, per se, but it's more about after I retired and had the opportunity to work with Indigenous youth and youth facilities, um, playing the game, introducing them to the game of lacrosse in uh, their territory, which is a game that came from their territory. And then I got to lecture uh, and talk about all these incredible local histories of where the lacrosse fields were in the 1600s and 1700s, or the ways in which lacrosse was used to heal Indigenous nations and Indigenous communities, and still is to this very day, that there's a spiritual connection and interconnectedness um, between all those kind of epistemologies of Indigenous uh, communities. And so it, that was an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. I'm actually just going to follow up on that, because one of the other questions that came in was, from your experience, how or can lacrosse or how does lacrosse play an active role in cultural resurgence? And it seemed like you were just touching on that at the end of your comments. Do you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, there are a couple. Uh, I think it's better to highlight some programs that are doing it. People can, um, I highly recommend getting online or Facebook and checking them out. But there's a couple programs. One is the Iroquois Iroquois Lacrosse Program. Um, they're a Haudenosaunee-based lacrosse program that travels throughout basically the world, sharing uh, Haudenosaunee knowledge of the game, uh, whether it be stories, oral histories, the governance, uh, all of those kind of cultural aspects of the game. Uh, Anishinaabe Bagatawa Wiwin does the same. Uh, you can find them online as well. And then, of course, there's the Haudenosaunee Nationals men's and women's team who represent the Haudenosaunee Nation as a sovereign nation. And what we see is these programs are all contributing to resurgent histories based in their nationhood. That's really important. It's not a pan-Indigenous identity. It's Haudenosaunee-specific or it's Anishinaabe-specific. I've seen Cree communities doing this in Saskatchewan um, where they use uh, Cree knowledge and Cree language and um, these types of things to introduce used it through a reintroduction of the game of lacrosse that they've always had and traditionally have had. Um, so there's these kind of resurgent practices that are taking place. Uh, and I highly recommend people look them up. They're, they're in some incredible programs uh, that can use a lot of support. Yep, yep. Could I have one more question for Ivona? And then maybe just to wrap up, um, if we've still got a minute, uh, I'll, I'll ask you one uh, final one to both of you. So Ivona, uh, one of the audience members asks, does linguistics refer to both written and spoken expressions of language? And uh, as a follow up, is it easier or harder in adulthood, perhaps, to learn through one or the other, written or spoken? Yeah, so it was, as language, we're interested in kind of what's happening in our, in our brain, and we don't really care about how it comes out, whether you sign or speak or whether it's written. Now, of course, you know, biologically, the uh, spoken language and sign language precedes by a very long period of time written language. The, uh, there are some studies showing that there's a special part of the brain which has developed differently in humans after they started using uh, uh, reading and writing systems. Um, the, when it gets to teaching, the um, uh, we don't have enough systematic uh, evidence to actually know um, like for learning what what um, uh, works better 
uh, for um, polysynthetic languages, which are um, uh, which the type of uh, type of languages that Haudenosaunee languages uh, fall under typologically. So these languages that have a like and like, so in English, you know, when you have a sentence, the sentence has these separate words, and you kind of learn the words separately by one, and then you can create a combination of two, and then you learn three and whatnot. These languages, what they do is they kind of like one word is this very 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 long one sentence is this very very long word that has different parts attached to each other and they have like a multiple relationships among them among themselves and it's impossible to break them down in the straightforward way of use of like learning individual words or the way you do it like when you're learning french or spanish or whatnot right so the uh so there's like a the, like a really challenging problem with like how to get adults actually like to, to remember all those things and so um the uh of another um which is the uh, program at Six Nations. So that's the longest running uh, adult immersion programs from the programs that I work with. So they run uh, now I think they're like 25 years already. The And they have gone kind of like through every single thing. And so until fairly recently, they were using written language. And I think around only like 2008 or 2009, they switched to oral uh, way of teaching and now uh, partially and then and then entirely. So now it's entirely, uh, everything is oral and the result has been tremendous. So at least like uh, looking at the, their experience, the oral uh, learning and the method of, of uh, just presenting the language orally and for the students to uh, be constantly speaking has been much more beneficial to adult mm -hmm. learning, but it's also an immersion environment and that's kind of replicate, it's hard to replicate for someone who learns language only like a three hours a week or something. Mm. So I don't know whether this is a general experience, but at least for these programs, the oral method has been uh, much more effective. Oh, that's that's very interesting. So our, our last question is simply, uh, you know, Alan already gave a couple of examples, but um, are there other uh, sort of additional readings or websites or, or other um, places people could go to, to learn more? Uh, Ivona, maybe you can go first. You've got your mute off. Um, yeah, so it's a bit tricky one. Like the uh, there's very little on uh, adult immersion uh, out there. Uh, the uh, can the academic academic teacher my recommendation would be uh, the same. What what um, Alan was suggesting for learning more about um, about lacrosse in communities. So there's a lot of um, like a Facebook uh, sites for different uh, language programs, uh, centers for children and so on in Gavananga and the Six Nations. So if you just like search for um, um, you know, individual languages and things on Facebook, the uh, there's going to be lots and lots of stuff that's going to uh, come out. And hopefully soon, especially if my indigenous graduate students will start publishing more papers based on their research, there will be more to share and recommend. Academic work as well. Great, thanks so much. And Alan, before you answer that question, I want to ask as a, a connected one, is there any place our uh, listeners might be able to get a hold of a copy or view a copy of your um, the Ironworkers short film that you were talking about earlier? Or do they have to wait for the next time it's uh, featured in a, fil in a film festival? So we're hoping to release it uh, actually after we showcase it uh, and premiere it at McMaster um, next month, uh, in March actually, um, with Labor Studies. And once that happens, it'll be posted online. You can look up, uh, all our information is on indigenousironworkers.com and it'll eventually be posted there. Um, as for resources, just quickly, I have a couple recommendations. If you're interested in learning more about the game of lacrosse, I highly recommend the documentary called Keepers of the Game. It's about an Indigenous women's uh, high school lacrosse team and everything that they have to go through as an all-Indigenous team. Uh, it's an incredible, incredible story out of Akosasne. Um, so the Ginyagahaga team. So it's called Keepers of the Game. It's on Apple TV. And the other one I would recommend people uh, watch or check out, might be interested in, is about ironworking. There's a documentary called Little Cognawaga, 
so it's Little Cognawaga to Brooklyn and back. And it's on the NFB website. It's free. You can Google it uh, and, and watch it tonight. Uh, but it's called Little Cognawaga to Brooklyn and back. It's an incredible documentary of Indigenous men and women going to New York City and kind of their experience throughout the 1930s to the 1970s. Great. Thanks so much. Well, we've gone over. Um, I think that's a good sign. And uh, but I just want to thank everyone uh, as we wrap up for their questions. And uh, of course, I want to thank uh, Alan and Navona uh, for their time here tonight and sharing their research with us. And I also want to thank Nina, our alumni engagement officer here in the Faculty of Humanities, who really did all of the behind the scenes work to bring everybody together tonight. Um, and I, uh, you know, want to remind everyone that this is just the first of a series um, that we'll be doing from now on on our researchers in the faculty and so please keep your eye out for further invitations and uh, a last reminder to share your thoughts uh, in our survey which will be in your inbox following the seminar um, we have lots of other events coming as well so so please check out the website and uh, and read your email from uh, humanities alumni engagement um, thank you for attending and have a wonderful evening. Good night.